two, one. Professor Martin Green, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the on the Care Home Show for the for the third time, uh, which is very exciting. Albeit um, we do find ourselves in uh, very strange times at the uh, at the moment, quite unprecedented times. So uh, the the plan for today is obviously to uh, to be able to run uh, a Q and A style uh, interview where people have written to me and basically asked me to ask you questions about what is going on in the in the world and what's going on in the uh, in the social care world to hopefully offer some reassurances on on what's happening and how we can see ourselves selves through this so i think bef before we start can i get a quick view on uh, from you martin around uh, so what's your uh, what's your perspective on where we are today well, I think, first of all, I want to acknowledge the amazing contribution of social care staff who are really working tremendously hard in, as you say, in a crisis. In terms of where we are today, I think we're a little bit further forward as social care in that we have now got a bit more recognition from NHS England, the government and the Department of Health and Social Care. Our next challenge, though, is to turn that increased recognition into some tangible outcomes because the sector is facing some big challenges, which I'm sure will come up in the questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, OK, well, great. Let's uh, let, let's get stuck into this then. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to let you know who's asked the question and then what the question is itself. Um, I know that you've said some of these questions we may or may not be able to, to answer, um, but I guess we'll keep that as an open loop and uh, maybe we'll create some uh, another episode later on down the line as, uh, as, things, as things progress. So uh, my, my first question is from uh, Nimat Kassam, um, who is of the Langdales group. Um, so her, her question is, so will there be extra funding uh, and when can it be claimed? Well, I think there should be extra funding. Part of that extra funding will come from the extra uh, people who are coming into services. We're trying to negotiate an agreed figure on that, but we're not having much success at the moment. There should be also some business funding around business contingency, and the Chancellor raised a lot of issues in his statement. Now, we're not clear about how we access that, but certainly social care should be able to access some of that business funding, as well as some of the social care funding. Okay, great. Um, just going to ask the, uh, the the people that we've got on the on the call today. Obviously, we've got uh, a number of people from the social care world that have joined us for for recording. Does anyone have any specific questions around that, or shall we move on to the next question? Has anyone got any hands up? I can't see from my screen. No hands have gone up. So. No hands have gone up. Okie doke. Um, let's move on to the next question. Um, okay, so Tanya Shukla, uh, the, uh, the director of DivaCare, said, how can care homes best support hospitals in this time of crisis? I think care homes are supporting hospitals and mainly that's about taking people who are not in medical need so they're emptying hospitals in order for the hospitals to use all their capacity for people who are in crisis so they can certainly help in, in that way and they are doing that and we're starting to see the emptying of hospitals and it's the care home sector that's uh, really in the vanguard of that. Okay perfect thank you. Um, any questions on that particular question? Nope. Okay, we'll move on. Um, so Parvan Popat, the uh, CEO of TLC Care, said, are normal fees higher than that that the CCG would normally pay? How do we ensure that CCGs will not impose blanket deductions to the fees later down the line? Well, we're trying to negotiate that, Parvan, but we can have no uh, cast iron guarantees. But one of the things we're trying to negotiate is we're trying to negotiate an agreed fee. And we're also trying to negotiate what will happen at the end of the crisis when we step down from level four. We want to have some surety that people will still be, if they're going to be in those care homes, paid at that particular level. So um, I think it's a work in progress. OK, great. Thank you. Any hands up on that question? Uh, nope. Yeah, there's one, Sanjeev. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, so thank you for that answer. Um, obviously, I know we've many of us have chatted on the group already, and that is a comment about the inconsistency across various CCGs. We're dealing with three at the moment of just negotiated block contracts, and they're both wildly different 
not only in terms of fee, as in terms of what the expectation is, time of admissions, you know, um, how long they might last for. So I appreciate you said this is coming, but obviously this has started now and uh, obviously it needs to, you know, move forward quite quickly because we're expecting a lot of admissions to come in the next two weeks. I feel that's going to be the peak. Um, so I guess it's really around how do you actually, how do you actually get all the CCGs round together? Because they don't seem to communicate with each other. So, so how are you going to get them all round together to agree this? Because I think it's quite important to understand that. No, well, Sanjeet, they don't communicate and they don't get round together. So what my response to that is, if they're going to negotiate with care providers individually, I suggest care providers start with their private funding fee and say that is what we charge take it or leave it because if they're not going to adopt a position where they have a, 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 a across the board discussion then I'm afraid if they want to negotiate with everybody I suggest people just negotiate on the basis of their private fee being their starting point. That seems to be quite consistent from a lot of the people that I've spoken to uh, as well about a uh, position relevant to that set of circumstances. I think people just have to stay strong to um, to yeah to what their private fee is and uh, stick to their guns. I think that's uh, that's great advice, Martin. And I think Thank you. if I can just jump in, the local authorities will try to make you feel guilty about accepting their fee. It's a question of then you deciding whether you want to hold fire uh, and use this as an opportunity to ensure that the funds that are out there that you get a share of that yeah i, I agree abnish because they've said the government has said that the nhs can have what it wants we they have negotiated with private hospitals so there's absolutely no reason why they can't negotiate with the care sector not least of which because the care sector is where all the capacity is so i think we need to be really robust about holding our line and if we don't hold our line, if we're not robust, they will try and walk all over us. And we must not let that happen. Though the background to all this is that we are trying to negotiate that agreed fee, which would then stop a lot of transaction issues at the moment where you're having to negotiate with endless CCGs or indeed local authorities. So Parvin had... Um uh, uh, another uh, question that's relevant to that, um, his particular point was the fact that some of the fees that he felt that he was being offered were, uh, were a joke, quite frankly. Um, so his next part to that question was, uh, so, so what guidance is being provided by NHS England and the Department of Health on releasing occupied hospital beds? Well, there is guidance which says they want to do it. And I would say to you, Parvin, if they have offered you a, a level which is a joke, just say you're not taking it. Again, standing firm in the set of circumstances sounds like the, the best option. I agree. Okay, great. Um, so Jay Patel uh, of Acacia Care has said, so um, there are 3.5 million antibody tests that have been announced uh, today. This was yesterday. Um, are we going to see any for social care staff? Well, yes, we must see them for social care staff because actually social care staff are working with the most significant priority group. So there is nobody who's in a social care service that's not in the risk group for people who have a, have a risk of this virus or are very vulnerable. So it's my view that we should be absolutely seeing testing. I want to see testing for residents and staff because if we get testing for staff, when staff have been ill, it might not be coronavirus or indeed it might be that they've had the coronavirus so they'll be able to come back to work so that testing has to be available for us and we're pushing very hard at dh to make sure that it is okay great and there was a next next phase to that question as well and it, it, and that was is there going to be covid19 testing for residents as they come out of hospital Yes, that was one of the things we were trying to agree, that everybody who comes out of hospital should have a COVID-19 test, not least of which because they're saying they want to empty hospitals of people who are not uh, in the category so they can free up beds for people who might have COVID. So we've got to know whether or not people have got COVID-19. So my suggestion is when people come and talk to you about emptying beds, make it a prerequisite that they've had a COVID-19 test and say if they have, when then we can take them. Of course, even if they've had COVID-19, if you have the right equipment, some people have the capacity to bury a nurse and to isolate. So it's just about knowing exactly what you're dealing with so you can deal with it appropriately. Makes sense. Any, uh, any questions um, on that particular point? 
So we got a question from Hugh uh, McNeil. Hugh, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Simon. Uh, just a question around those tests. Um, how early in an infection um, are they effective? Uh, so if someone's just picked it up in the last 24 hours, could, could that test give a, a false negative and you take that person into your community? Do you know? Um, I don't know the direct answer to that. Um, and we'd have to seek guidance from NHS England. But I think what we should do is seek their guidance. Uh, I understand that the testing should be able to identify people long before they're symptomatic. So hopefully that would be within the, the, the time frame that we need. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Sean? I think it's pretty much what he was just, just uh, talking about. It was if, they, if, if residents are being tested, what is the time frame by the time they come to us? What was the time frame there? Saying that it should be tested. Are we saying that they are already tested or this is going to be going forward that everybody will be tested? Yeah, Sean, it should be tested. Because there's the, we have to be clear about the testing. There are some tests which identify the antibodies. So this says, yes, I've had the virus and I'm now over it. What we need is the test that says you are currently somebody who has the virus. So I think we need to be really clear that there are two different discussions around testing. What we need is testing to say whether or not people have got the virus so that we can then decide how we manage them rather than people who've had the virus and through it. Okay, I think we've got another question from um, Sanjay. Hiya. Um, what was really interesting in Oxfordshire, we had a blanket no um, from Oxford University Healthcare Trust saying they won't be testing. Um, so based in that position, we actually pushed back on that resident until we were ready. So we've said no until we've got clear tests. I think that's I think that's very sensible because of course you have to be mindful of the safety of your other residents and your staff. So I think it was a sensible thing to do, and I think in inevitably the issue about whether or not they can empty hospitals is very dependent upon whether or not they have a testing regime. Because if they haven't, frankly, we don't know what we're dealing with. So the answer might be no. We can't take these people. Okay, Sanjeev, got another question from you. My and that was basically the basis of my question because as you've alluded to there's two kinds of tests there's a test that tells you if you have it now on there not right now which is the pcr test and there's the obviously the test which is the antibody test which says if you've had it and are you possibly immune can you come back to work with the pcr test my understanding is it takes a bit of time to come back and hence if we're kind of moving into this phase where they're asking for this rapid discharge um, of, of potential residents from hospital you know, obviously, I kind of feel a bit of a moral ob obligation to allow that rapid process to occur to free up hospital beds. But at the same time, the results of these tests are just not going to come back within a day or, or 24 hours, likely, at the moment. So that's where the dilemma really lies. And I think, it, I think it's really important that we, we are unified in our response to this, because if you get some providers willing to do it without, without the test results and some with, then it just muddies the waters of what, what actually is important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we've got to be really clear about this and not least of which providers need to be clear because of that issue about the safety of their current residents and also staff. And let's not forget, if somebody comes out and we don't know their status and then they uh, produce an outbreak within a care setting, that might require the NHS to deliver 60 beds rather than one. So I think from all those points of view, we need to be really clear and we need to be steadfast in saying this is a prerequisite before people are transferred out of hospital. Okay, thank you for that. Final question from Joanne. Yeah, I mean, it's just building on what people have said, but I don't know if anybody joined the hospital discharge webinars that the NHS were running uh, yesterday. I, I found the, the tone of some of the discussion there quite concerning. Um, very much it's uh, of a mindset of uh, staff on the ward, once somebody's fit, they need to make a decision, get them off the ward, get them to the discharge lounge and get them out within the hour. Uh, and, you know, care homes need to work with us. I don't think there's any insight or consideration whatsoever to the, um, the challenges that care homes are currently facing now with staff off duty and staff challenges and the impact of what they, they're only seeing it from one side of the coin. And, and similar to what Sanjay said, 
we've got we've had similar uh, trusts uh, um, saying that they just they just won't test. Um, even for residents that are, uh, I've had residents that are in hospital for other reasons that are due to return to the care home and they will not test them. So what do I do then? Do I refuse to allow a resident to come back to their own home? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, you do, Joanne, because the bottom line is you have to be responsible for the other people in your services. The point you made about the webinar was very well made. They only see things from one point of view. Uh, but the bottom line is we have to be in the space where we can live with the decisions we make. Now, if you took somebody back and then there was an outbreak in your home and 19 of your residents died, there would be a really big outcry. And what would happen as well is inevitably people would start to bring the blame culture in and you and your colleagues would be in the firing line. So I think we've got to be really robust in our response to the NHS. Mm -hmm. We are absolutely here to help. We are all very clear that we want to help, but there are some bottom lines that we have to maintain but the reason we're maintaining them is for the safety of our current residents and also for the fact that we don't want to include a, a person with corona which could then infect the rest of the people in that service who would then require hospitalisation. So I think, you know, from those points of view, I think the thing we need to do is be really clear about why we're saying no and make it very, very explicit about the impact on current residents and the impact on the NHS if they uh, transfer somebody who later infects the rest of the people in that community. Okay, um, thank you for that. Just a very quick final question from Sean then, and then we'll move on to the next uh, section. Yeah, a, a, a couple of feedbacks that we've been getting is almost like a, it's a standard line that we're following all guidelines set out by infection control. That, that's hit us a few times. Is it because, I mean, do, do they, do they have set guidelines at the moment? Well, I think part of the problem is that they don't know about what happens in care homes. and They don't know what you do already. So what my view about that is, you know, care homes have very stringent positions on infection control. And I think what we have to do as care homes is follow them. Our challenge, though, is we're trying to follow them sometimes without the requisite PPE in place. So we have to be mindful of that as well. So what my position is, is to say to the NHS, actually, we have a lot of expertise in our sector. These are things that we deal with daily. What we need from you is the equipment and the fact that if we have testing, we'll know who we're dealing with and that we can put in place the normal processes that we always put in place. I mean, let's not forget we've been through a lot of other infectious issues in the past and we've dealt with those and we can deal with this, but we need the support of the NHS and we need the equipment from the NHS. Thank you. Okay. Simon? Great, great stuff. So um, Adam Welsh, uh, one of the directors of Autograph Care Group, uh, says, so how can we best protect staff in the circumstances relevant to entering and exiting care homes? Uh, what do we do about breaks, new, new uniforms and uh, new kit, etc.? Well, I think we have to go down the road of saying we do all the things that we would normally do if there was an infectious uh, outbreak. So we have to follow the guidance of Public Health England, which is about how we make sure that people are washing hands, make sure that all the things that we always do in care homes are done. Um, in relation to how people are going out and about, that is very difficult because it's very difficult to control how people behave when they're off your premises. But again, um, it's going to be difficult to, to do the, the same things that you would do in normal situations, like make sure there are two metres between people. Um, it, it can be done probably with staff, but it can't necessarily have been done between staff and residents. So that's why we need the PPE and we need to go down our normal process of infection control. Thank you, Martin. Any questions on that particular point? Okay. Uh, Joanne? Yeah, just to say on PPE, and I, it, I think I fed you a question through on that, Simon, but it might cover off now. Yeah, um, one of the challenges that we're having at the moment is that we've got plenty of stock of PPE, of sanitizer, um, aprons, gloves. We've had our force drop of the face mats, but what the piece of PPE that we just cannot get is eye protection. And in the guidance that came out on PPE late last week, it specifically states in it that if there's any procedures where splashes um, may occur, then uh, eye protection should be worn and you just can't get it. 
um, and I wondered what what can be done to, from the NHS supply chain to reroute some of that because I know for the, the, the distributors that have been appointed by the Department of Health are saying that they had a call yesterday at 3.30 and all of the um, supply chain is being diverted to the NHS and they won't let them supply eye protection to the care homes. Yeah, I think that's a big issue, Joanne. And um, I have to say, part of the issue is that there is eye protector problems in the NHS as well. So um, I think there is not enough supply of eye protectors. Uh, this goes to the heart as well of whether or not the NHS should be issuing endless guidelines until the, the, the point when they can actually deliver on it. So I think, again, you know, every care home manager or, or care home operator has to make decisions about what is in the best interests of their staff. Now, if there are issues where eye protection is desperately needed and you can't manage that particular case, then you might have to tell the NHS that unless we have that equipment, we can't manage this case. I just jump in there. We had a situation um, in the, on this morning's call where the care home is requesting that the NHS provide the PPE when the resident is uh, coming into the home. So, uh, and they won't admit unless the PPE comes with the resident. Just something to think about. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Amnish. And I'm sure, Joanne, um, that, that is, is something which we should all be talking about when we're talking about um, admissions and, and people being discharged from hospital. We should be saying, well, what is the process around PPE? And remind them that it's their guidance, not yours. Simon, back to you. Um, so this question is uh, is actually from uh, from Sanjeev uh, Sanjeev Patel. I don't know, Sanjeev, would would you like to ask the question, or would you prefer if I did? Uh, oh God. <laughs> you you do. It. I can't remember what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot there as well. I didn't want to uh, say it without asking the question. But um, okay, so uh, will there be financial support for workers on the fourteen or seven day? isolation uh, SSP uh, and can we make use of some of the government initiatives which seem to be aimed at longer term unemployment? Um, I think the short answer to that is we don't know um, and we have to try and clarify that. <coughs> For example some of this stuff that's found maintaining staff who are not going to be able to work but they want them to be on the payroll um, that of course there is a, there is a process for that but of course we're not even sure what the process for that is in any sector of the economy never mind social care so we, the, these are areas where we don't know the answer to them yet but we're pushing very hard to get the answer because the important thing is to maintain our staff teams and particularly when we've got trained staff uh, we don't want to lose them uh, if they have to self-isolate Any questions on that? Sorry, thank you, Martin. That was, um, uh, yeah, that you, you've sort of answered the question. I was alluding to that very fact because it seems slightly unfair at the moment. I know many providers have made their own decisions on how they um, support people during the isolation period, whether it's seven days or 14. But it seems to me it will ramp up very, very quickly uh, the number of people on the 14 day or seven day isolation process. And it seems like many of the initiatives, as you quite rightly pointed out, look to support people when they're in you know, the furlough process where they're, they're not made redundant officially but they're put in furlough but i can't see and it's difficult to understand whether we are able to make use of that within the care sector because it's unclear whether it applies to operating businesses and uh, whether we can use it for individuals on those processes i think that's a really important question that needs yeah. to be cleared up because that's probably one of the biggest fears of all of my employees which we try to address you know as a company that will support you but it's, it's important to have definitive answers out there about this. No, I absolutely agree. It really is. Um, and, um, and it does make it very difficult because businesses are in a very difficult position because they want to support their staff, but they're not clear whether or not the legislation the Chancellor has uh, outlined is going to affect them. My view is we are fighting for the fact that it should because they are businesses like, like any other. Martin, can I just request, um, the sunshine's coming quite brightly behind okay. you. If you could just you close. me to um, shut yeah, my that Is that yeah. better? Let me, let me do that. Yeah, that would be good. What Thanks. a pity we all can't be out in it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Very good. better. That's great. Is that better? Okay. Thanks, you, Simon. 
Okie doke, great. Um, so uh, my colleague Sue Goldsmith uh, at uh, SPNP asks, so at a macro countrywide level, uh, to your knowledge, what impact has there been on social care relevant to staff going off sick, agents fees, agencies being restricted uh, and the influx of residents being discharged from hospital? Well, I think it's getting quite um, uh, severe now. So we've seen it really ramp up in the last three or four days, particularly because I think rather unhelpfully, the government sent out texts to various people and they were just sent out as blanket texts, which said, you know, this is the position on self-isolation, for example. So, of course, what that did was it put a lot of, of staff into the space of saying, well, yes, I am in this category or yes, I have been in contact with somebody, so I'm not going to go into work. So I think this is becoming something that's getting very critical now. Sure. I don't one of those things that it's probably going to get more difficult before it gets easier again as well which is uh, I guess uh, something that we're all going to have to kind of bear the brunt of to some extent but um, okay so thanks for that Martin um, so my uh, another one of my colleagues Martin Murphy the managing partner at SPMP said um, so given the current situation and the increasing demands that they are experiencing how do you envisage the government funding social care in the future uh, after uh, the, uh, the coronavirus outbreak? Well, I think this is a pivotal moment. It's really shown the, the absolute necessity for care services, both community and residential. It's really interesting how the policy is saying, oh, nobody wants to be in a residential care home and local authorities jumping up and down and saying we're not going to commission residential care. Well, now suddenly they realise that the whole of the system is actually dependent on residential care. And I think um, now is not the time for that discussion. But frankly, we must not waste this crisis. We must make sure that there are some longer term gains that the sector gets. And part of that's about recognition and understanding of our contribution. Uh, and too often that has not been acknowledged. Well, after this crisis, we will show how important we are. And we need to use that as our foundation to have discussions around the future. Here, here. Thank you for that, Martin. Um, okay, so uh, Niraj Luthra, uh, the, uh, one of the directors at Arlington House Care Home says, if staffing levels deteriorate to dangerous levels, who do we call upon for help? Well, first of all, you should notify the regulator. You should also contact your local authority because they're supposed to be in, in, involved in resilience planning. Um, so, and also, I think within the capacity tracker, there is a position whereby you can identify where your staff are if you're involved in capacity tracker. And that should alert them to the fact that there are some dangerous issues. But certainly, you should inform the regulator, you should inform the local authority, and probably also you should inform NHS England and say, look if we're going to continue to provide a service for these people we need some support from you so those are the three areas that i would focus on okay great thank you um so uh lorna badrick okay. from dlc care oh sorry no, no. A question from you. i didn't see you sorry simon thank you um we've been having a debate about whether we should in fact be preemptively tapering occupancy in order to provide headroom in our staffing and the staffing pool. Um, but obviously that has, if everyone were to do that, that could have a negative impact on the capacity of the whole system to take, um, to take residents out of hospital um, or, or other settings where they would otherwise uh, have demands on hospital. How, how, uh, how should we think about that when we're thinking about our contingency planning across, across our groups? Well, I think the first thing to say is we are in a different world. So what would be desirable might not necessarily be possible. So I think what you have to do is you have to recalibrate where you pitch. Is this a safe staffing regime? Are we able to provide enough staff to be able to support people around their essential functions and activities of daily life? So I think one of the things that we need to realise that in this interim period we have to start changing the measures of what is acceptable and uh, we've been having conversations with the regulator about that because this is now a crisis and all the things that we would like to do and that we have striven to do over many years might have to be put a bit on hold in this crisis until we move out the other side of it. Have you got any sense of when any guidance might come from the regulator? 
in that dimension? No, I think part of my issue and part of my irritation, I think the regulator has been very behind the curve on this. I would expect them to be much more proactive around some of that stuff. Now, Ian Trenum has said, and I was in a teleconference with, where Ian Trenum said, do not use the regulator as, as the excuse not to do anything. So what he was in effect saying was, if the reason you don't want to do something is because you're frightened of the regulator, well, in this crisis, do things and then ask for forgiveness rather than permission. So he has said that, but he needs to be much more explicit about sending those messages out to the sector so that the sector is really clear. And what we have to do now is also something which the system hates to do, which is respect the professional judgment of people who are managing and delivering care services. Okay, Andrew, you got a question? Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not so much, uh, it's along the topic of, of staffing, it's not so much a question, more of a, uh, an observation and um, awareness of, of things that are likely to, to even get even worse for us as far as our staffing is concerned. We've had um, a number of uh, instances over the last couple of days where um, a lot of our bank staff who were doing bank hours obviously with the with the NHS as well have been pulled into the NHS full time now so they're not available to us we've also had two instances um, just today where we've got um, trainee nurses working with the NHS who were um, obviously working for us part time as well they've actually been fast tracked and had their nursing qualifications almost given to them in their final year without having to do their uh, final certificates to get them actually into the NHS and working on wards. So they've um, immediately pulled off all shifts and uh, been pulled out of all shifts from um, from our homes. So it's, it's just it's just a really an awareness that uh, you know as well as we're going through staffing, the NHS is clearly going through it as well, and the impact has been uh, is cascading down to to us in in care homes. Um, so it's not so much a question, just a, an observation. No. Andrew, I think it's a very pertinent observation and one of the things that I've said to the department, I've reminded them that they do rejoice in the title of the Department of Health and Social Care. So when they're looking at things like returners who are retired, etc., well, we need to make sure that some of those are being positioned in social care. And that's particularly important for some of the specialist roles like nursing, for example. We've seen a lot of community nursing being pulled out of um, social care, so the district nurse isn't going in. And then we're asking our staff to to do things like diabetic injections etc uh, without the proper support so I thought also that they should and I've uh, suggested this they should also do some more um, uh, quick training uh, approaches where they could do that by the internet etc just to give people a bit of um, uh, confidence when they're having to do things that would normally be done by a nurse and also we need some of those retired nurses in our sector too. Yeah. Sanjay you got a question? Yeah, it's a, it's another sort of statement question. But Martin, what we ran into issues with was um, the NNC um, stopping international nurses from Europe now wanting their IELTS exam. That's obviously a very new requirement that they've set in, what, about a year, about a year ago, actually, now. Can't they just lift that? Because there's a lot of nurses in the system who have their PIN numbers, awaiting the, the IELTS exam and or just maybe soften it slightly because there's a number of nurses in the system waiting to be approved I've got carers working sorry nurses working as carers and I could have them in my care home as nurses or they could join other systems or whatever but they're just waiting there for approval yeah, and I absolutely agree. And that's something that we're pushing with the Nursing Referee Council. The other thing I've asked for is I've asked for a suspension of all the requirements for people who are on student visas who can't work more than I think it's 20 hours or something that needs to be swept away. I've also said that people on benefits, their working requirements should be set, swept away so they were able to work within the care sector without it detrimentally affecting their position on benefits etc so these are logistical things that just need to happen um, and they, for me the challenge is that the system is very bad at making instant decisions and everybody is focused on well what will happen when the post-mortem happens in the you know 15 months time will they blame me and I think we've just got to get a culture which says this is a crisis let's do it and that's why I think sometimes uh, the issue about ask for 
uh, forgiveness rather than permission pervades as well. But it's very difficult for care providers, I know, because you might find yourself being hauled over the coals later. So one of the other things that I'm talking to the department about and talking to governments at all levels is about the issue of indemnity and how we make sure that social care is not being hauled to account later for things they did in the best interests of citizens at times of crisis. Absolutely. Um, so, Joanne? Yeah, it's just a comment really in terms of the post-mortem and the reflective analysis that happens later down the line it's it's been good to see lots of things uh, lots of bureaucracy fading away uh, in the last week or so and i think uh, it also makes me think well if it could be done now why have we had to suffer all of this pain as a sector for so long um, so it was a comment really is to think, I think this really actually provides us with an opportunity to look at what is the red tape and the bureaucracy that we've been working around, what things have we done differently during this time, and actually what things of those could be sustained in order to make it easier for us to run the sector. Jan, I couldn't agree more, and in fact I made that point in uh, discussions with people in Downing Street uh, only last week I said there are lots of things that we're going to do which are going to be much slicker and much easier and a lot of bureaucracy will have to be swept away well let's not go back and reinvent it or let it happen again and it's really interesting when you look at how many bits of the system are there to cause a problem and if we can get rid of some of those bits of the system and rely more on people's professional judgment I think that's all to the good so I'm determined that when the post-mortem happens Joanne we're going to have those conversations and we're going to be pretty direct about saying these are the bits of the system which first of all are not helpful and secondly which were not seen to be a problem when they were swept away. Okay, thank you Simon, back to you. Um, great thank you. Um, so this was uh, a question from uh, uh, Joanne Balmer um, who, uh, who's just been speaking then. So. Um, <clears throat> She asks, so supermarkets are very kindly offering specific time slots for people that work for the NHS, but people who work in social care are unfortunately being turned away. Now, what could we do to encourage supermarkets to look after people in social care who have also been working 24, 48 hour shifts? Well, in fact, the chair and, and I and colleagues were discussing this uh, at a meeting earlier today. One of the things we're going to do is contact the supermarkets and remind them that social care workers are key workers. I think also the uh, fact that we now have the opportunity to use the care badge is a bit of a symbol in the same way that we use the NHS badge. And what we need to do is just get all bits in the system to understand what key worker means and that social care workers are part of that. I've just had to contact a chief constable where somebody was told despite the fact that they showed their um, their identity and had a letter from their employer were told oh you don't work for the nhs you shouldn't be out and you need to go home uh, and this sort of thing just is not acceptable we are key workers uh, we've also had um, issues and i've been in touch with the department of education and science we've had issues where schools have said oh we're not taking these children because they're not the uh, nhs staff so all those things are on are on our case um, I've also said to the Department of, um, of Education that unless I get some responses from them, I'm going to start naming and shaming schools on Twitter. So that might move the agenda slightly forward. Okay, any questions on that? No? Okay, Simon. Okay, thank you. So uh, Richard Adams, CEO at Steers Healthcare, asks, what arrangements are being drawn up for increased demands for funeral directors? Uh, well, I think this is an area where there has been little or no thought within government. Um, there are some capacity issues being discussed in government, which are about how you transport and keep corpses. But I don't think they've been much discussion about the capacity of funeral directors. Um, and obviously what was interesting was when the government lockdown details were announced, funerals were still, a, people were still able to go to funerals. So I think we've got a, a bit of a, a, a long road in a way to get people to understand that there's the issue of the funeral, but there's also, there is needed capacity plan as well. What happens if there are lots of people who die? And we've seen in Italy 
that there has been a real challenge there and people have had to create mortuaries and move people around and also there may be some decision later down the line if this affects lots of people to do what might be described as instant cremations uh, and that funerals will have to be suspended and that has happened in parts of Italy already. <clears throat> okay on that um, note can we carry on Simon? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so Gareth Macklin, uh, the MD at Macklin Group, um, asks, so how can the government support people with transferable skills from sectors such as retail and hospitality to transition into the sector rather than have them getting paid 80% of their salary to sit at home? I think this is an issue that um, has, again, uh, finally got onto the government's agenda. We've been talking to both the associations of retail and hospitality, and we're trying to engage them so that we can find ways of switching people seamlessly from one sector to another, not least of which because some of those people in things like um, hospitality and retail do have a lot of customer facing skills and they have very transferable skills. But what's also required is they do need to do something around either sweeping aside or making really easy things like the CRB check process because we cannot have people who want to transition being held up because of bureaucracy. And my view is that we just have to trust care providers to make reasonable decisions uh, based on their processes. And in fact, we sent out some guidance to, any, uh, to Care England members recently about some of the things they might want to do in order to fast track some of the processes that you have to go through when you're employing new staff. So Martin, it's my understanding, um, so we've got a WhatsApp group with uh, uh, a lot of the people that are on the call today and many others. Uh, it's my understanding that DBS checks are, are actually being fast tracked. Apparently, um, I think one of the co comments was uh, it's, it's never been so fast. So hopefully that's a, a, a good sign and something that can be sustained over, over the, uh, the coming months and, uh, well, however long it ta takes really. Yeah. Well, I hope that it'll be sustained forever. And in fact, they had yeah. ramped up and they were doing about 25,000 um, a day. So um, they'd sign significantly increased the capacity. But it did make me smile because I thought to myself, well, if they're doing that when most of them are having to work from home, and if they've got the capacity ramped up to 25,000 a day, made me wonder what they were doing when all the staff were in the office. It does make you wonder, doesn't it? <laughs> Can I just come in there about volunteers? Uh, I've just read that... Uh, over the last, I think it's 24 hours, there are about 170,000 people volunteer for the NHS. So uh, the NHS is obviously a huge piece of machinery uh, and they're going to get all the, uh, uh, the people that are looking for volunteering and some of these roles potentially migrating towards the NHS. So we've got to make sure we do our bit to capture those volunteers and the workforce uh, into social care. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, Abnish, and we need to make sure that um, the conversations in the Department of Health recognise that it's about an integrated system, and some of those volunteers will be really helpful in some of our services, though I know there are concerns within some um, organisations about people coming in who might be exposed to the virus, so that again is something where I think individual just, uh, ought to make their choices about whether or not they deploy volunteers. Okay, um, got a question from Preet. Preet, do you want to come in? I can't hear you, Preet. No, we can't still hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm muted. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Just on your point, Abner, about capturing the workforce, we've seen a significant number increase of applicants in the past two weeks via social media. So we've revamped all of our social media adverts and we've seen probably a 60% increase in the number of applications coming through. All of the interviews now are arranged in 24 hours via Skype. So again, use, utilizing the technology we're utilizing today, uh, with DBS checks, we've got a number of new staffers but also sending out all the training in advance of them starting. So all of the e-learning platforms we use, um, we're sending out all the training in advance and we're getting quite a lot of new applicants coming through. So. Again, in terms of volunteers, it's potentially something to utilize the volunteers are social media platforms. We have a lot of volunteers come through for activities. So lots of people are sending in videos to the residents, but the point of capturing the workforce, I think social media is really key at the moment for capturing local applicants looking for work. 
Joe, yeah. sorry, just on the point about the supermarket, Sainsbury's and Waitrose have both confirmed that social care workers can be included within that hour. So we've had that confirmed locally and it's also on their website. Yeah, I, I know, Preet, and uh, part of the problem is that even though they've confirmed it at the centre, and I know it's on the website, the challenge is that when people go and they show their documentation and say, I'm a social care worker, it's not always uh, that they get into the supermarket. So I think, again, you know, one of the things they've got to do within the supermarket chains is just remind people that if they have a letter from their employer and that employer is a social care uh, organisation, people can come in. And it's just been about the fact that sometimes if the letter hasn't got NHS stamped all over it, some uh, uh, supermarkets are still saying no. Yeah, I mean, I guess you guys have probably done the same, but we've also set up um, partnerships with our provision suppliers to have a lot of stock on site. So uh, staff will offer lunches and take away um, meals in the evenings. So we have a lot of items in terms of provisions and basic essentials on site in our full staff. Yeah, Preeta, and I think a lot of care providers are doing that. And also, you're, you're so right, the suppliers are also sometimes sending stuff that people can, can use at home as well. And, and these are good ways in which we can support our employees. Don't forget, a lot of these suppliers will, be, will have been suppl supplying the hotel trade as well as restaurants, which is all uh, completely fizzled out. So there should be enough supplies to come to care homes. Um, yeah, so you'd think they'd be fine. Okay, Simon? Um, just one insight that um, uh, I can't remember uh, who I heard it from now, um, but, um, but somebody was suggesting that when it comes to, from a, from a staffing perspective, finding new team members, um, nurseries have obviously been hit by the coronavirus, an awful lot of them have had to, uh, had to shut. Obviously, the CRB checks are um, uh, being um, uh, uh, they're being turned around really, really quickly now. But uh, obviously, people that work in nurseries they have to have their checks as well. So that might be kind of a good hunting ground for people looking for um, looking for staff if they are if they are suffering. So that's just a a, a, um, a, a, a hopefully a useful insight for uh, for people. But um, so this this is the last question from uh, the questions that were that were emailed to me. So. Anne Taylor, uh, the CEO of uh, Hilton Nursing Partners, said, uh, and this is a, a, a really important question, do you think that central governments, the NHS and local authorities will change their perception of social care having seen the amazing way that the sector has responded during the epidemic? Well, I think my view is that um, we have to make them. And uh, one of the things that we need to do is we need to capitalise on the fact that we have been at the very forefront of supporting the, uh, the citizens who are the most vulnerable, and we must not let that be forgotten. And there's an old adage that you should not waste a crisis. I believe that we wasted the Southern Cross one. Well, I'm determined we're not going to waste this one. Can I just come in there and add uh, a few things there, Simon? You uh, uh, come in as well. Um, You'll see that on LinkedIn and through the, the group, we're trying to do various initiatives around uh, linking in the NHS and social care together using the care sort of uh, identity and the badge. Um, what we've got to do is really proliferate that, I believe. Um, and if anybody's got any better suggestions or different suggestions, we're very happy to hear it. Uh, as Martin said, this is a, a, an enormous opportunity to showcase everything that we do. Uh, we, were very, we were very fortunate to have our uh, Hungry Hippo thing go viral. Uh, through some help from a friend of ours um, who had some links and connections. We've got to put more of those kind of good news stories out. Uh, Simon's uh, uh, done something around Facebook. We, we posted that last night. Many of you have got your Facebook uh, um, uh, profile picture with now the new frame. We've got to continue those kind of things, putting videos out. I mean, if you look at the NHS, they've started this um, uh, campaign about dancing and stuff, I can't remember what it's called. Um, we've got to create either link in with that, not try to compete with them, either linking with them and join forces with them or come up with initiatives that uh, I think are going to really get people to see and come in and see what goes on in our care homes. Um, Sanjay, you going to come in there? A, this is a completely personal perspective, but the bit about um, families being behind a window and people going up to the doors with the signs, um, I saw a video of that and I didn't think that that necessarily portrayed sort of social care in the best way as if we've got people locked up as prisoners and then the family are outside doing a love actually scene. 
um, we all are using tablets, phones, Skype and things like that. And we've just got to be very careful about the message that we're sending out as a community and as an industry that we're not stuck back in the times because essentially all of the carers um, have have those devices. We, you know, a lot of homes are using technology. We've just got to be, I, I don't know how it came across to others, but it just necessarily didn't read very well because the comments below those things were like, oh, look at those people trapped up. Look at that, you know, this poor family going over. We've just got to be very careful about the messaging. We, we have got to be careful about the messaging, Sanjay, but we should also remind ourselves that the majority of people who put stuff on social media don't put the good news stories on. So we must remind ourselves that actually well, one of the things we should do is when we see stuff on social media that we think is good around our sector, we should be validating it by all retweeting it, putting comments, that sort of thing, because I do think we've got to really change the conversation. Um, but I take your point. I think it's well made. The other point I want to make, of course, which I would normally make, is to say, you know, the more we are together, the more we'll have power. So I would like everybody to join Care England so that we can say we represent this great sway. We are the largest representative body and I want us to get bigger because the bigger we are, the more impact we're going to have. OK, you got that message loud and clear, I hope. Uh, Sean, I think uh, you had your hand up. You've put it down now. Is it? I did. It, it was pretty much what, what Sanjay was saying. We're, we're, we're the same. Where we kind of want to get away from that um, trapped look. But also, I think people with capacity. It, it, it was a wonderful thing to happen. But people without capacity, it can cause quite a bit of distress. Um, the, the other question as well was that you know the, the letter campaigns that's going viral at the moment as well, which we were looking into, but we were a little bit hesitant because does the virus carry then on the paper, on card? So that, that was my hesitant with, with going forward with this letter campaign. Uh, that's, that's a really good point, Sean. And I, what I should do is try and seek clarification on that from, uh, from the technos at uh, the, the department as to whether or not it's going to be carried on paper, etc. Because I know there was discussion about how it was carried through banknotes at one point. So we should really clarify that. But there are ways, and Sanjay is so right, there are ways through, um, through social media and through um, technology that we can also put people's letters and we can talk to people, etc. So let's pursue those as well. Yeah, yeah, e-letters, e e e-videos, e um, iPads, brilliant. But yeah, my question was more on the paper side. Okay, yeah. we've only got a few minutes now. So Simon, do you want to kind of bring it to a bit of a close maybe? And uh, Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, look, Avnish, thank you very much. Uh, Martin, everyone else, I uh, really appreciate everyone's contribution, everyone's questions, everyone's thoughts and feelings on this. Um, I'm, I think this is going to be a really useful resource for uh, obviously the people on the call but we're, we are going to turn that into a into a podcast as well we'll distribute it the way that we normally would as well um, the one thing that I would say is let's try and get the podcast out there as much as as much as possible I think if, if everyone's asking these questions well if you're asking these questions then everyone's likely to be asking these questions as well so I think it will be good for people to hear um martin's answers and to hear people's different perspectives on on things so uh if there were if there were three things that you could do for for for, for me today um it would be so um the obviously martin's mentioned the fact that um uh, there's, there's power in numbers so give some serious consideration if you're not already part of care england um we've we've launched a uh, as avnish said we've launched a, effectively like a, a facebook campaign so it's um you know how you get Facebook frames, so they had uh, one for one for Pride, where there's like a like a wrap around your kind of Facebook profile. Uh, there's now one of those for for social care, um, so you can if you click the the camera on your Facebook um, uh, profile, um, you can basically search and find the uh, the details to be able to add the uh, the uh, proud of social care, proud of the NHS um, uh, format as well. And then one last thing we talked about getting things. Uh, encouraging things on social media so um, somebody uh, Abdish was it you that mentioned the, uh, the 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 dancing NHS workers earlier mm, yeah that's an hospital so um, uh, so Tay Nagendran um, one of the um, uh, one of the members of the whatsapp group she started a 
Facebook group, uh, I believe, called Social Groove, which is uh, basically the social care sector to the, the uh, dancing NHS workers. So uh, hopefully maybe there'll be a, a social care and NHS dance off at, uh, at some point as, uh, as well. But I just want everyone to be able to get behind Care England, behind getting changing the, uh, the Facebook profiles and hopefully social social group as, uh, as well, because it's, it's, it's all going to contribute to raising the profile of social care and just letting the world know about the amazing work that the social, social care sector does. Okay, thank so, you. Sorry, Martin, you're about to say. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Simon, for, um, uh, for uh, developing this. I think it's been quite useful. I hope people have found it useful. Great stuff. Maybe okay. this will just as a just as a last uh, last thought then uh, maybe we don't make this the last one in a, in a few weeks time we'll do another update uh, we'll uh, we'll answer some more questions and um, hopefully have uh, we'll be able to shed shed some more light on some more 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 important topics well i've got the last minute so i'm going to just say a couple of words um, first of all simon just want to say a huge thank you to you uh, for the commitment that you're showing the whole of the care sector with your podcasts that you're doing on a regular basis that you really are uh, improving the communication, the knowledge uh, throughout the whole sector and getting everybody together, uh, as well as this WhatsApp group that's really gained some momentum. So just thank you for your commitment uh, to the sector. Martin, obviously, thank you for putting your neck on the line coming here uh, on this conference call to uh, answer questions and, uh, and share the work that Care England are doing to really improve uh, what happens over the course of the next few months, as well as the uh, commitment across the, the whole piece as well. And Sally for setting up the, the technology behind all of this so that we could all be on this course. Sally, thank you for that as well. And yeah. thank you all for your time. And uh, as uh, Simon said, let's uh, make this uh, something that's uh, a regular feature. Uh, and we can do that through our WhatsApp groups and uh, invite Martin Green every so often as a guest uh, to answer questions and uh, tell us what's going on in the sector. So uh, yeah, for me, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much.